Greetings, everyone. I am Linda Level, president of BIO, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the penultimate event of our 2022 conference, the announcement of the Plutarch Award. Um, we will hear from the very hardworking and very diligent and very expert panel of judges forming the Plutarch Committee. The chair of the committee is Nigel Hamilton. Other members of the committee are Gretchen holbrook Derzina, Carl Rollison, Heather Clark, and Catherine Reef. Now I'll turn things over to you, Nigel. Thank you, Linda. Um, well, this past year produced many wonderful biographies. What we did, thanks to uh, Michael Bergen and <clears throat> Holly Van Leuven, who succeeded Michael at the bio newsletter, was with suggestions also from bio members to ask publishers to see almost 200 biographies as they were published during the course of the year 2021. Each month, Heather, Carl, Gretchen, Catherine, and I met on Zoom and discussed the books, drawing attention to what we thought especially highly of and sharing our frank thoughts. I have to say, as a biographer, I was proud and inspired by the sheer diversity and quality of the books we read. Biographies by women and men, biographies of women and men, some whole lives, some partial lives, uh, famous lives, unknown lives, short lives, long lives, single lives, group lives, lives of many different ethnic backgrounds and color. I think you'll get the picture when we talk about the 10 we long listed. And pretty much all of them wonderfully researched, referenced, critically told, with heart, and composed with interesting narrative structure and brought out by many different publishers a real testament, in other words, to the ongoing golden age of biography that we still live in, despite the many trials our, bio, our democracy is undergoing, especially, I might add, the assault on something we used to take for granted, telling the truth, the, verifi the verifiable truth, based on real, not completely imaginary facts. Well, over the year, we managed to whittle down the number of truly outstanding biographies to a long list of 10. 10 books that, as fellow biographers, and ours is the only international organization that gives such a prize, exclusively judged by fellow biographers, we thought most highly of, published in the calendar year 2021. So, one by one, let's take a look at them in alphabetical author order, starting with Claude Legg's The Black President. I must say uh, that was published by uh, Johns Hopkins University Press, by the way. I must say this is, as all of us agreed in our deliberations, a beautiful narrative devoted to President Barack Obama's years in the nation's highest office as 44th US president. The first man of color to be so elected, in fact, twice elected, serving from 2009 to 2017. Given the four year presidency that followed President Obama's presidency, it's literally heartwarming to look back and be reminded in Professor Clegg's biography how for eight years, people here and abroad felt relieved and often comforted to have a responsible adult in the White House. Not a perfect president, Claude Clegg is justly critical of President Obama's tendency to opt for what he calls pragmatism over principle, the choice of what will hopefully work rather than what's ideologically right. But it is a very, very human portrait of a man, a black man, a smoker, a father, a politician, 
and his family through eight demanding years of American and world history as seen by the black community and the white community, dealing with myriad issues from same-sex marriage to healthcare, Michael Brown, the capture of Osama bin Laden, a terrific achievement. Hi, I'm Heather Clark. Another remarkable work on the 10 titles we long listed was Rebecca Donner's All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, the true story of an American woman at the heart of the German resistance to Hitler. This is a stylistically innovative, deeply researched and passionately written biography of Mildred Harnack, an American who was part of the German resistance during World War II and who was beheaded by personal order of Hitler. Harnick's great-great-niece, Rebecca Donner, takes an enormous risk by writing novelistically and setting her story in the present tense. The risk, we felt, paid off. Part historical drama, part spy novel, Donner's book expands the parameters of biography itself. This is an extraordinary portrait of a woman who made the ultimate sacrifice for justice and whose name deserves greater recognition. I'm Carl Rollison. I'm delighted uh, that on the list is Calhoun, an American heretic um, by Robert Elder. Uh, Calhoun is probably best known as the author of nullification, this idea that a state could nullify the Constitution of the United States. He's often considered irrelevant to today's history. And yet what Robert Elder does in his biography is he doesn't just make Calhoun relevant, he makes us care about him. Uh, he presents him as a human being. He presents him as a senator, certainly a politician, but a family man, and a man who, who said on the one hand that slavery was a positive good because he thought of African-Americans as primitive people brought from Africa and civilized by slavery. That's a hard thing to fathom in today's environment. And yet Robert Elder shows why Elder in a sense, uh, or rather Calhoun projected uh, um, a kind of fiction about slavery, that it was his duty as a slaveholder to uphold civilization. It's really a remarkable performance. And toward the end of that biography, you really ought to look at how he treats the whole issue of minority rights and explains how Calhoun is relevant to that as well. Thanks, Carl. Uh, so we're moving from heretic to pioneering women. Uh, another outstanding biography on our long list was Janice Pinamura's The Doctor's Blackwell, how two pioneering sisters brought medicine to women and women to medicine. Janice Pinamura digs deeply into the diaries and letters of the Blackwell sisters, who were among the first women in America to receive medical degrees. The book reads like a novel without sacrificing historical accuracy and scholarly rigor. Nimura immerses us in the sister's 19th century world, conjuring up candlelit lodgings, muddy roads, and creaking wagons as Elizabeth and Emily travel through America, France, and Britain on their quest to practice medicine. Jeered in lecture halls and treated as curiosities off campus, they maintained a dignified courage and a relentless work ethic. Eventually, they shamed their skeptics and opened the doors for future generations of women doctors. Hi, I'm Gretchen Holbrooker Zina, and it's my pleasure to introduce another wonderful biography on our long list. This one was by Fiona Sampson, and the book was called, is called Two Way Mirror The Life of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and it's published by W.W. W. Norton. We often think of Elizabeth Barrett Browning as the sickly lady lying on the sofa in her father's house on Wimpole Street, but Fiona Sampson's two-way mirror offers a really impressive reevaluation of a woman whose poetry made her one of the most admired writers of her time. A woman oppressed for years by her controlling father, Barrett Browning made herself into a poet so accomplished that she rivaled Tennyson in praise and popularity, ultimately forging a life in Italy with a husband and son and inventing herself anew. Samson's writing and interpretation rivals that of her subject in this really 
compelling work. Thank you, Gretchen. Well, next, um, a terrific biography written by a married couple, <laughs> uh, Mark Stevens and Annalyn Swan's Francis Bacon Revelations. Uh, you know, in art history, there are catalogue raisonnés, and in biography, there are life raisonnés. <laughs> Francis Bacon uh, Revelations is a life raisonné, an intimate biography of a singular but arguably great artist from traditional cradle to his death in a Madrid hospital in 1992. Beautifully illustrated in color and in black and white photographs and told with a kind of cherishing ongoing intensity of detail, drama, personal reportage and perspective that's quite stunning. Did it help that the authors are husband and wife? Yes, <laughs> for they bring to bear a curiosity as well as a double immersion in the social, local, and historical context of Bacon's career that no one author could perhaps apply. What struck us all in particular was Bacon's curiously fusty beginnings in Anglo-Irish Ireland. Now that Sigmund Freud is long departed, the cradle years are less examined than perhaps they used to be. But as Stevens and Swan show, Bacon's childhood born the second asthmatic son of Major Eddie Bacon and his lady wife, literally Lady Charlotte, is just as fascinating and insight rich as Bacon's later gay peregrinations in London, New York, Paris, and nearly Moscow. Every page, in other words, is full of revelations, human and artistic. Thank you, Nigel. We're back in the 19th century with Oscar Wilde, A Life by Matthew Sturgis. There have been many, many biographies of Oscar Wilde, as Sturgis notes in his introduction to his biography. So why another one? Well, he has new uh, sources, primary sources to draw on. He also is very conscious of Oscar Wilde biographies. I think you have to be if you're writing about someone like Wilde. He looks at the really important biographies like Richard Elman's. He notes some mistakes Elman made. Uh, it's difficult to write uh, on any major figure without making some mistakes. At the same time, what Sturgis is really showing us is what he calls a historical wild. Well, what does that mean? It means that to some extent, previous biographers of wild have thought of him in terms of course as a literary figure and have taken his own, in a sense, the way he created a fiction of his own life as the structure of their biographies. And what Sturgis is trying to do is really look, you might say, granularly uh, at the everyday wild sometimes and how wild right up to the moment of his death, when one is thinking of his life as perhaps tragic, uh, wild is still having fun with himself, with his image, with his society, with the world in which he inhabits. And I think this is what makes Sturgis's biography memorable, that it's dealing with the form of uh, storytelling that biography is and showing us that there's yet another way to tell a familiar story. Hi, I'm Catherine Reef. We all thought very highly of Dorothy Wickenden's The Agitators, Three Friends Who Fought for Abolition and Women's Rights, published by Scribner. In this book, Dorothy Wickenden chronicles the lives of three 19th century American women of varied backgrounds who were united in friendship by their mutual goals, namely the abolition of slavery and the fight for women's rights. Martha Coffin Wright, a Quaker wife and mother, Frances Seward, whose husband William was prominent in national politics, and Harriet Tubman, the formerly enslaved woman who led many to freedom on the Underground Railroad, all defied societal conventions to further their objectives. Wickenden also presents key events that raised the consciousness of these and other Americans, 
events including, but not limited to, the Seneca Falls Convention, which was the first gathering uh, uh, uniting people who, were, who worked for women's rights, publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So all in all, readers get an insightful look into these women's lives and the times that shaped them. Thank you, Catherine. Next on our alphabetical list of authors is Francis Wilson's Burning Man, The Trials of D.H. Lawrence, which was published by Farrar Strauss and Giroux. Francis Wilson's brilliantly conceived and executed biography of D.H. Lawrence presents his life through the surprising structure of Dante's Divine Comedy, which follows the poet's struggles through hell, purgatory, and paradise in search of and accompanied by Lawrence's own Beatrice, the very troubling and puzzling wife that we all have learned in various biographies in a very different way. We get a very different view of the marriage and their peripatetic life. Lawrence life, traveling and writing his way from England to Europe, to Ceylon, to New Mexico and Mexico, reflect his battles with personal relationships muses and physicality, all while, while compulsively writing them into his changing visions of the world. A writer who has been perhaps put aside for a while now really comes to life with this very important and dazzling book. Finally, on our long list of 10 outstanding biographies published in 2021, there was Richard Zenas Pessoa, a biography published by Live Right. The 20th century Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa, was a writer in the spirit of Borges and Saramago in that his work does not align easily with an established literary movement or tradition. He's less widely known than the other two, but Zenith hopes to change that with Pessoa, a biography. Pessoa invented numerous personae that he called heteronyms, and for each of them, he created a body of work, poems in which he explores the, the, concept of self, the concepts of self and identity, which engaged his thinking all his life. Zena's book is rich in detail as it follows Pessoa through life and more than competent as it introduces the poet's work. Pessoa, a biography, gives readers a strong foundation for exploring that work on their own. Thank you, Catherine. Well, uh, now we come to the matter of the winner of the Plutarch 2021 Award for Best Biography. You know, <clears throat> it wasn't that difficult in the end for the committee. Unanimously, we chose the book which, for originality, freshness, structure, passion, critical lens, and narrative brilliance, as well as humor, was simply too good to beat. It is therefore my great pleasure and privilege to award the 2021 Plutarch Award to Francis Wilson for, for Burning Man, uh, The Trials of D.H. Lawrence. Many congratulations, Francis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The Plutarch Prize is, as you say, judged by fellow biographers. And so there's no greater honor than to be its recipient for 2021 and amongst such a long list. Added to which, there's no organization akin to BIO in the UK. And so I'm doubly grateful for your appreciation of Burning Man. And I see Burning Man as my American book. And it was, it was written for the most part when I was fortunate enough to be a Cullman Fellow at the New York Public Library in 2018. And I benefited while I was living in New York, I benefited enormously from the conviviality and generosity of, uh, of other biographers. 
including the late great James Atlas, who I miss very much. The UK, as you probably know, offers very little financial support to writers, and so I'm enormously grateful to the Coleman Scheme. And I'd also like to thank my, um, my editor at Farrah Strauss and my agent, Sarah Chalfont at Andrew Wiley for taking a punt on Lawrence and staying with me as the book went way off grid. <laughs> and, uh, Lawrence's life was yoked to America. It was to America he turned when the rainbow was banned and burned in London in 1915. And it was the American journals and magazines that published his strangest and most brilliant writings after the war, his, his travel writing, his poetry and his polemics. And of course, Women in Love came out first in America before a British publisher would touch it. So Lawrence rested all his hopes in America, which he saw as his paradise after the years in hell. And while he of course inevitably quarreled with America, his experience of New Mexico was, he said, one of the most important in his life. I just want to quote what Lawrence said about New Mexico because it's so stunning and I, and I absolutely agree with him. The moment I saw the brilliant proud morning shine high over the deserts of Santa Fe, something stood still in my soul and I started to attend. I felt this too in the Southwest, but I also felt it on the East Coast. And it makes me happier than I can say that Lawrence and I have found a readership in the States. Thank you so much to all the judges for this terrific honor. Congratulations, Francis. We are honored to be able to honor your book. <laughs> and you may not know that if to the extent that Bio has a home, it is in Santa Fe, where our original founder <laughs> lives, still lives. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> So How that, appropriate. Yes, that's very appropriate. So big congratulations to Francis. Thank you to the members of the Plutarch Committee. Um, and this, we have one more event in our conference. I hope you all will all stay around for that. It's a social hour. Please BYOB and enjoy yourselves. And otherwise, this concludes the 2022 Bio Conference. Thank you all.